Hi, my name is Sara Plasencia and today I feel truly honored to have this amazing interview with the film producer Daniel Conrad Cooper, who has a very long journey on this industry with film credits on films as Dunkirk, Red, Red 2, Total Recall, Captain America, among others. So, how are you? Thank you very much for accepting this interview and welcome. Thank you very much. Hi, Sarah. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to talk to you and to be helping Barcelona International Film Festival today. Thank you very much, dear Daniel. Uh, please tell us more about the film producer, Daniel Conrad Cooper. So, well, I started out about 16 years ago and I started out as a runner on film sets. So I was uh, making the tea and doing the photocopying. I started right at the bottom. And I think that that's actually been one of the most valuable things for my career and for my career progression is that I've done lots of different jobs in the film industry. And that's really helped me to become a good producer now. So, yeah, I started off, um, yeah, just helping out as a production assistant and as a runner. And I was able in those jobs to sort of understand how the mechanics of a film set and how how a film is put together. And um, over that process of learning and working on lots of different films, I think I've worked on nearly 40 feature films now. Um, so it's been quite busy. Uh, yeah, I've sort of gradually expanded my knowledge and my understanding and I've been able to have some career progression. And I've gone from being a runner to being an assistant, to being a, a junior production manager, to being a, a production supervisor. And now I work as a producer for most of the time uh, producing my own projects and helping other people get their get their projects together. So that's been a bit of my of my journey. Amazing. I want to ask you how it was your journey and change from independent features to big American studio films. The main the main difference is that studio films uh, money is not a problem for them. Like they find ways to to solve problems using money, and they have money and they have time. And those are the easiest way to overcome the obstacles that come up when you're making a film. And then the more independent the film, generally the lower the budget. And um, as you work on independent films, you have to be a bit more creative with your problem solving. So you have to find different ways to solve problems that maybe don't involve spending money, but involve uh, you know coming up with new and clever ways. You also have smaller teams. So on an independent film, everybody has a few different jobs to do. Whereas on a big studio film, everybody has one tiny specific thing that they have to take a lot of responsibility just for that one thing so that that doesn't go wrong. So it's a it's a real difference in scale. But for me, um, seeing how things worked on studio films gave me a bit of a basis as to how to make smaller films. And then the experience that I've had on smaller films has really helped me uh, do better on studio films. So now I work pretty much between the two. The big studio films still pay my bills, you know, it's the best place to earn any money. Um, but the independent films that I really love making and that are, that are my passion projects, those are what sort of nurture my soul and that, you know, keep me happy. So um, yeah, that's the sort of difference between the two. But it's been very gradual moving from one world, the studio world, to the independent world. And really, that's what a lot of filmmaking is about, is about solving problems. And the more experience that you have on film sets, the better you will be at solving those problems. Because the theory of filmmaking is all pretty straightforward. And in an ideal world, a producer would have the easiest job ever. He would just organize uh, all these people, and all these people would come together, and they would make the film. But the reality is that a film set is a very organic thing and no two days are the same. So you're always going to different environments, working with different people, doing completely different things every day. And because of that, there's a lot of opportunity for things to go wrong. And um, yeah, so you can be as prepared as to the to, till the cows come home is an expression we use, but still something will go wrong. And it's really about you being good at your job as a producer is about how you respond when things go wrong, um, from the weather turning bad to maybe a bit of equipment not turning up or to somebody not being available. You have to learn how to adapt to different situations and um, and how you tackle those problems. As I said, on bigger studio films, you have time and you have money to solve those problems. And on smaller independent films, You've got to find creative ways to make sure that everything doesn't stop because 
when you get to shoot a movie, that's the most exciting bit. Uh, it's a bit that I think all filmmakers look forward to. Um, it's a very energizing journey, but you've got all of these expensive things together at the same time. And you've got to really make the most of having those elements together. Can you please tell us about your experience from starring as an assistant on Stardust to director and create your own film company, Rather Good Films, with futures on budget up to four million pounds? Sure. So, yeah, so I started off on these big studio films. And um, what I tried to do was I... I knew I didn't want to be an assistant forever, but I knew that I needed to understand the industry better and I needed to broaden my contacts. So I started working on these big films as an assistant. And, uh, you know, the way to get hired in film is to impress people who work in film. So I would turn up early every day. I would be energized. I would be very positive and I would I would just try and be as useful as possible because really the film industry and any freelance industry Um, you get hired by the people that you know. And so I created a bit of a network. I impressed the people that I work with. And then when they went on to other films, hopefully some of them phoned me up and said, hey, Daniel, do you want to come and work on this next project? And so that's how I began to sustain a career. Um, but making that move from working on other people's movies to working on your own movies is quite a big leap because I realized pretty early on that nobody was going to give me a job that I hadn't done before. So I had to find a way to get experience as a producer. I knew I wanted to be a producer, but I hadn't done it. And I think this is the problem that almost everyone in the film industry faces is that you're always trying to get to the next level. You're trying to progress up the ranks, but you're trying to do a job that you haven't done before. And so you have to find a way to get that job. And I found that As a producer, I could produce my own films, just very low budget, short films with groups of friends, uh, with not very much money. And so I started putting together my own projects um, with very small budgets. And because some of those projects went quite well, I was able to get people to trust me with more and more money. And so I went from making zero budget short films to very low budget short films to short films with a bit of money. And then after I'd had some successful short films, I was able to work on my first features because I'd built up that trust with investors and trust with crew as well, whereby people knew that if they gave me their weekend and they came and worked on my films, I would finish those films and those films would be at a good standard. And hopefully they would uh, go on and be in festivals, uh, play in um, uh, online and in cinemas. Um, yeah, so... Building up your own experience is the best thing that you can do as a filmmaker and giving yourself the job that you haven't done before is the best way of getting hired. Can you share with us an advice uh, to get success promoting a project or getting funds or finance to make an idea happen? Yes. So finding the money is almost always the most boring uh, and hardest bit of making a film. And I think that the best thing that you can do as a filmmaker is think about what your strengths are. What do you have that other people might not have? Because often you can add value to your projects using the things around you in your own world, because you maybe don't notice the fact. I mean, I live in London, and so there's this city on my doorstep that I see every day and doesn't feel special and different. But when I put that on film, if I put my own home, my own neighborhood on film, suddenly that can add value. Uh, and I don't necessarily have to spend money making a film about London and set in London. Um, what I'm trying to emphasize is really that you should play to your strengths. Try and shoot a short film with people that you know, with locations that you have access to, with props that you have access to. If you've got a friend with a nice car, put that nice car in your film. If you've got an auntie with a dog, put that dog in your film. All these are ways of adding value and making it look like you spent more money than you did. Because whether you're making a tiny short film um, or making an enormous Christopher Nolan film like Dunkirk, everybody is trying to make it look like they spent more money than they actually did. If we have a million dollars, we're trying to make a film that looks like it cost five million dollars. If we have a hundred million dollars, we're trying to make a film that looks as though it costs 200 million dollars so it's really the same throughout everybody is trying to make things look as awesome and as big as possible 
So playing to your strengths is really key to getting momentum and to getting things going. Because if you can show investors that you're clever in the way you're putting your projects together uh, and that your projects look valuable, um, that's how you get an investor excited by showing them that there's a possibility that you're going to help them to make some money with whatever they invest in your project. Absolutely. As you mentioned before, the connections, networking, uh, the challenges create experiences for your career. So what was it like working with the Oscar winner, Stephen Warbeck, on your most recent project, The Man in the Hat? Can you tell us more about this musical comedy across friends? So yes, yeah, so we've just uh, released a film called The Man in the Hat, which is directed by a man called Stephen Warbeck who is a very experienced composer. So he got an Oscar for writing the music for a film called Shakespeare in Love. Uh, he also did the music for Billy Elliot and a lot of very big successful films. And, um, but he is a, an older man and he uh, came to me with this project and he said, Daniel, I've not been a director before, but I'd like to direct a feature film. And this is somebody who is already quite famous in a certain sphere. So already a very successful composer. And because of that, he had some very good connections to cast and to great creatives who were up for coming and getting on board a project. And I think that the example of working with Stephen is, is a good one because Stephen, um, it, you know, has, it, it was very experienced. And really, if you don't have a lot of money for your project, you can either go to people who are very new to the industry, who are looking to build their experience, or maybe you can look at people who are, are very advanced in their careers and are maybe looking to try something different, because those are the people who might work for on a slightly lower budget project. So Stephen uh, worked with another director called John Paul Davidson, and together we put together this project that was very... Uh, ambitious and fun and creative, but did exactly what I was talking about earlier in terms of playing to your strengths, trying to make something clever and interesting and fun uh, from the pieces that we had access to. So the film, The Man in the Hat, is about a man driving across France in a tiny car. And uh, we got Kieran Hines, who's a fantastic actor, who is in uh, Game of Thrones, Um, and uh, and a bunch of, of really great uh, leading leading film roles, and he plays our lead character. And he's driving across France uh, in this tiny car. The only thing is, he doesn't speak French. So we've made this film with very little dialogue in it. There's lots of music, as you'd expect. I was working with a very experienced composer as a director, so it's a very musically rooted, really fun adventure film. And um, we were very lucky because obviously. It's been a pretty tough year for most of the world uh, in 2020. So it turned out to be a very good time to release a very positive, very energized film that sort of celebrates uh, the outdoors and human interaction and sort of beautiful visual countryside spaces. So we were making a very positive, energized film and we were able to release it at, at just the right time. It, we got very lucky. And I think for any film to be successful, First of all, you have to do a great job. And then second of all, you do have to get lucky. And I think it's the same with starting a career. You have to be really good, but you also have to get lucky because it's a really competitive industry. But there are things that you can do to increase the chances of getting lucky uh, by packaging your projects properly, by thinking cleverly about what the world is doing, what the world wants, and where there might be a market for your project before you get too advanced in the making process. Inspiring, you know. Uh, I love these, all these amazing experiences that you have and that you are sharing with us. Okay, so you already have some films on Netflix. So what advice could you give us to get uh, all projects placed in platforms like this one? So I think in order to get your films to Netflix or to any platform, I'm very lucky all of my feature films have been released in cinemas is that I feel it's my job as a producer to be thinking about an audience. And if I want to raise money to make a film, I need to make a film that has some value and that some people are going to pay money to go and watch. And I think that it's very easy for filmmakers to lose sight of that and just to make a film because they want to make a film. But that's fine if they're going to pay for it. But if they're going to get someone else to pay for it, you've got to think about 
how if you've got this money, how you're going to pay that money back to whoever's paid for your project. So for all my films, I've always thought about, is this something that I would pay money to go and see in the cinema? And do I think that other people would pay money to go and see this film? Because if you're making a film and you're telling a story that is interesting or engaging, or it's got interesting actors in or interesting themes, that's how you get to an audience. Um, and so my films that I've completed have uh, attracted sales agents that have then presented the films to the international distributors across the world. And I'm lucky in that a lot of my films have gone to a lot of different countries. And it's the most exciting thing when you see your film translated into a different language and you see it dubbed or with subtitles and you realize that a story that you told normally with not a very high budget starts to travel across the world and certainly seeing the posters for my film come out in Taiwan, in Spain, in Italy, um, sort of across the world, um, it really sort of motivates and, and inspires. So really Netflix, like everyone else, like the cinemas, like the television stations, are looking for content that an audience wants to see. Uh, and that can also be presented quite clearly. What experience are you going to offer to the audience if they sit down? If they give you an hour and a half of their time, what experience are you going to give them? And if you can promise an audience a good experience, somehow through your poster, through your pitch, through your trailer, maybe you can get that audience to pay some money uh, to watch your film or to take the time to watch your film. And um, really, that's what you should be thinking about from the very start as you're putting your project together. How can I make this project appeal to an audience? Because ultimately, that's where you want it to go. Daniel, uh, can you share with us what do you think that will happen with the film industry in this post-COVID world? Yeah, I think COVID has been um, a real, an enormous challenge over the last year. Obviously, a lot of film production has stopped and everything has ground to a halt. And just now, as we enter 2021, films seem to be starting to get going. It seems to be getting busy again, which is good news for all of us, I think. Um, I actually see this post-COVID time as a real opportunity for independent films specifically, because those big studio films that cost $100 million dollars take a long time to get going and um, take a long time to shoot. And so I think that over the next year, there's going to be a dearth of content. There's not going to be enough films being released. And so if you can make an independent film, now is the time to do it because there is an increased market. There's an audience out there that wants films. And I don't think that the world is going to be creating enough films for that audience. So if you release a film now or you make a film soon, you're more likely to get into film festivals. You're more likely to get deals for it because there's less competition. And as long as we keep our standards high and we don't make a bad film or a film that's not clever and isn't thinking about its audience, if you make a good film now, you have more chance of success than ever before. So that should be a, a rallying cry, hopefully, to get people to go out and stop talking about making a film and go and make it. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, how important it is for filmmakers build a digital presence and in social networks? Yeah, I think it's worth being really conscious of what is out there about you and about you as a filmmaker. If you made a film 10 years ago and it's on YouTube and it's, it was maybe the first film you made, maybe it's not very good. When you're about to work with somebody, that person is going to Google you. They're going to search online for who you are. And if the first example they find of your work is something that's not very good, they're going to form an opinion of you very early. So try and be conscious of what message you're putting out into the world online. Um, I have a, a website where I've sort of curated my content so that when people are looking for me, I can sort of steer what they think of me by choosing what information I show them, by choosing my best work and putting it forward first. So I think it's really important to have a presence online because you want people to be able to find your content and to be able to find you in order to give you work. Um, but you should really think about curating that content and not just putting everything out there, just keeping your best work front and center so that when people search for your name or for your project, that it's only the good clips, it's not the 
muck ups and not the bits that went wrong or not the the bits from your career when maybe you were still experimenting it's the the most advanced work um is present online when people search for you definitely um uh, we are starting this 2020 year so this is a 2021 year so i i want to ask you what is the next what is coming up for uh, daniel conrad cooper this year aha uh -huh. so well, I have a feature film that is uh, releasing in the next few months. That's a, a horror film, actually. It's called The Reckoning. Um, it's directed by a man called Neil Marshall, who is uh, quite a celebrated horror director. He did films like The Descent and uh, Dog Soldiers and Hellboy. Um, I've just done a film with him, which is called The Reckoning. Uh, yeah, which should be out, I think, around Easter time, February, March, across the world. So that's exciting. Um, and then I'm looking to shoot. I've got a couple of projects. One that I'm very excited about is a script called The Narrows, uh, which is set on a canal boat in England in the uh, 1870s. That uh, is a, just a script that I'm really excited about. Um, I've got a project, uh, maybe a second project with Neil Marshall that we might shoot uh, overseas at some point this year. Um, yeah, I think it's always important to have a few different things bubbling away that might happen because you never really know which project is the right project until one of your projects gets its money together. And once your project has its money, then it's the right project. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Daniel. It, is, uh, it was an amazing interview. On which platforms uh, can we follow you? Uh, can you share with us your social media, website, everything? Sure. So. Uh, my company is called Rather Good Films, and my main source is my website, which is uh, rathergoodfilm.co.uk. Uh, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram and all those places, Facebook too. Just Rather Good Films is, the, is my company name. Coming up with a good company name is really important. It's really difficult and takes ages, but I'm really happy with my company, Rather Good Films. They're not brilliant films, but they're rather good. Oh, <laughs> it is a pretty, pretty brilliant name. I, I, I like it. <laughs> Rather good films. Thank you very much, dear Daniel. Thank you very much for all the experience and all the knowledge that you have sharing with us during this interview. I feel very happy to have you there. And thank you very much. So, thank you so much. And thank you so much for the Barcelona International Film Festival for helping new filmmakers across the world to progress their journeys because there's very little help out there. And it's really great what Barcelona is doing to help people. Thank you very much, dear Daniel. And thank you as well to all our audience. My name is Sara Plasencia, and this is the Barcelona International Film Festival 2021.